So without further ado, Dennis Montagna. And Dennis will be part of a three-man team here. That's right. We get two more we can play basketball. Yeah. Okay, all right. So just there? Okay, great. Good. No. That's, that sounds great. Okay. Okay, well, I think, I mean, the first thing I want to say is um, how incredibly lucky we are. And especially after seeing the presentations yesterday and the ones we'll see today, we still have our artists with us. And um, I think we, we think about that more and more uh, and, and we really value it because we have an amazing opportunity that many people who've worked on, on sculpture sites like, like the ones we've been talking about don't have. Their, their, their sculptors, their artists have, are, are long gone. They didn't, you know, they didn't get a chance to ask them all the questions that we're having a chance to ask Wallace and really get to know uh, them the way we've gotten to know Wallace over the last couple of years. Um, and actually, and I, in addition, as this, let me take this luck thing a little further. Um, I'm really lucky, we're all really lucky, because uh, when this conference was first announced, I went ahead and put in a, a proposal to do something on Vallis. Um, about a month ago, we were able to uh, get two other speakers to be, be part of this. And so rather than having to do a, a solo, I'm, I'm really fortunate to be able to have uh, two people intimately involved with the project, uh, one on a day-to-day -day basis and one slightly less so. Uh, and they'll be speaking as well after I finish. Jefferson Curry will, will uh, come up and talk. Jefferson has been talking to Vallis for about the last year and a half to, to, to two years, uh, has built a relationship with him, and is, is able to, to get information that we, we are just amazingly lucky to have. Uh, the, our other speaker is Ron Harvey. He's a conservator who has, been, who has come into, into the, the project and is uh, able to, to do that. Very, you only get one shot at, at proper preservation planning, proper conservation planning, and so we really feel like that this is, this is happening now. So um, we're going to do our little, uh, our little tag team. Uh, and just quickly, I, I, well, my role, I think, today is, is just really to, to introduce you to Wallace's work, to introduce you specifically to, to the project that is underway right now, which is this effort to, to preserve uh, a collection of Wallace Simpson whirly gigs that currently reside on, on his farm in uh, Lucama, North Carolina. Uh, Lucama is located probably about five or six miles off of I-95, so it's in eastern North Carolina, uh, a little way south of, of, of Rocky Mount. Um, there were 30 of these that he built probably over about the last 30 years or so. And this is a, sh a shot of, of, one of one of the larger ones. They vary in size, they vary in, in complexity to really immense pieces like, like, like this one. Some, some smaller ones, we're dealing with a whole host of different materials that range from um, various kinds of metal. Uh, there are wooden elements, there are, there are fiberglass elements. That slide on the bottom uh, is, was constructed out of, a, out of a fiberglass water tank that then had uh, other attachments put to it, metal attachments. Uh, bicycle parts, uh, uh, re reflectors, you see the, the colored elements on the one on top. Those are all cut from, from signs. Uh, cut from various highway reflectors and attached to little wooden boxes. So you begin to see some of the conservation issues uh, in having this variety of, of materials uh, out of doors. In addition to all this, we have paint coatings of various different, different kinds. And, and Jeff will tell you more about Wallace's uh, paint selections and, and surface preparations. Here's another view of them. Here's an aerial view done from a, a, a cherry picker. This, this site is, is uh, his, his farm site is located actually at a, at a crossroads. There's a water element in the middle. There's a pond here. Uh, the, the thing about the, uh, the, the reflectors, these, these reflectors that were attached, is it gives a whole other aspect to Wallace's pieces. They not only have a daytime presence, but they have a nighttime presence here as well. Uh, if, you're, if you're coming up on the site with, uh, with, with car headlights, the whole site lights, lights up when, uh, when, when your headlights hit, hit in just the right way. And here's two views, one, one at night and then a, a, a view taken. This is in, in the shop where conservation is underway right now. But I want to show you a little bit about how the site is structured. This is, um, this is the site we were just looking at. This is that water feature. So the Vallis pieces on the site are located in this area here, running along this area here. But really the highest 
concentration of them as we face the dis- of this area up to here. So when you come down this road at night, that's when you get the, mo- the most dramatic light, light show. And I, I, I don't know whether or not Jeff has talked at all specifically about this, but I got a feel that this was, this was an, an intending thing, that he really intended this to be a, a, a primary point of, of, of approach, at least at night. Because this is that view. This is the view that you have as, as you come up on them. And as we, again, talking about site, this is, um, so the whirly gigs are here. This is where Volus's shop is. And here's a, here's, a, here's a view of it. You approach it from this, this corner, and it's, it's at this point become kind of a fortified in, enclosure, which he opens up every morning and then closes up at, at night. And this is basically where Volus does, does work during the day and, and holds forth. Um, and as you imagine, he's, um, whoa, we're getting, he, um, he entertains a number of people during the course of the day, and you know people have found him. They they've come off the interstate, and, and they they tend to find him. And this is where he usually has himself positioned. So he's he's sitting on his chair, and then if you go back back inside the, the enclosed shop, there's a there, he has a whole host of these smaller ones, and he really has created different levels of his whirly gigs. You have the large pieces which are on his farm, which he has sold as commissions. But then you also have a lot of these little small scale pieces that I think are really intended more to have something to, to be selling to people that are, that, that are coming off the highway. Um, he has become quite well, well known. I think that, and that becoming well known, I think occurred probably around in the mid 1990s. If you sort of look at uh, commissions that he had at that time, and then a recent boost in the last couple of years, he's become quite well known. There was a New York Times article from April of, of 2010 that brought some, some notoriety. But in the mid 1990s, people were taking notice of him. At this point, he'd been making whirly gigs for probably 16, 17 years. Uh, the uh, Science Museum of Minnesota visited him and, and put a whole education unit together on wind and wind power based on Bollas's pieces. And that unit is still up on, the, on their, their website. You can go and see it. Um, he received a couple of very prominent commissions at that time as well. The American Visionary Art Museum in Baltimore, which was really getting rolling at that point, commissioned him to uh, create a, a, a whirly gig. And it, it's their, their centerpiece. Now, here's the, the AVAM, the main museum, a secondary museum, and Wallace's Whirly Gig sits right right here. And you can see the view of it up on the top. So that was 1996 as well. Also in 1996, he was commissioned to create four relatively small Whirly Gigs to be part of Folk Art Park, which was a, a, an element of the run-up to the, the, the Atlanta Olympics in 19, uh, 1996. And you see that. It's, a, it's, it's kind of an odd park because it exists on, an, on a highway overpass. Uh, and and Vallis and, and several, several other uh, self-taught artists are, uh, are, are exhibited in, in this, this area. And we, we looked at these recently, and they're in various stages of, of functioning. Um, some, some are working, some are not. Here uh, in, in, in North Carolina's home state, the North Carolina Museum of Art commissioned a piece in, in 2002. And as part of this notoriety, Volus is getting talked with a lot. Uh, there's, there are some pretty ambitious video projects that have been going on. Uh, and uh, Jefferson is going to talk a lot about that when, when he speaks. So I really won't talk much about that, the, the Volus interacting with, with, with the world. But, uh, but Jeff's going to be dealing with, with that. So these, these pieces that have been out of doors, uh, they're, they're because of the very fugitive materials, very fugitive paint coatings, they're in, in, in many cases, pretty rough condition now. There was a move underfoot to try to do something about it, to try to, try to preserve the, uh, the uh, collection. And this, this got rolling probably a couple of years ago. Uh, you see a, a photograph on the left, a black and white photo is from 1989, when uh, the, he's posing beneath a very large piece of his that he's added to over time. This one is, is termed v, v, v. Simpson. Uh, and then you can see the way the piece appeared recently. Um, with uh, paint n- no longer present on a lot of the, the uh, structure. Um, functions partially, but not, not entirely. So the, so the challenge really is, I think, in some cases, to both 
um, put, a, put a plan together to preserve the works, but also to, to try to um, build public awareness of, of, the, of his importance as a sculptor. And, and, and the fact that you know, we, we're tip, we typically, we, we know that other 20th century sculptures have worked both with, with metals, painted metals, use of color, movement, me mechanical elements. And most most com commonly we know about Calder and Calder stabiles, see one in the middle, and then say George, George Rickey's uh, sculpture. But in terms of conservation, we're dealing with very much this, a lot of the same issues with Wallace's pieces as we are with these sort of better known, what we would call mainstream artists. So I think one of our challenges is to try to really create a conservation program that's, that's going to give um, give sculptures like, like Wallace's more their, their due, the way we would, we would treat uh, what we would more consider mainstream. In essence, I think one of the part of the things is we're going to need to really break down that notion of, of an outsider or visionary artist. These are all sculptors, and, and their sculpture needs to be evaluated, their sculpture needs to be cared for, and I think that's been the intent here. Um, a couple years ago, the Wallace Simpson Whirly Gig project got started, and what this is, this is a project that actually it is going to involve the removal of most of the whirly gigs from his farm and their transport down to downtown Wilson, North Carolina, um, which is the, the, large, the large town, probably about six or seven miles from Wallace's farm. Um, the, the family, his family is retaining ownership of, of the land and uh, they, they are on board with having these, these pieces move. This is an aerial view that shows the site of the whirly gig park. Um, this is downtown Wilson. Uh, and Jeff, again, we'll talk more about this. This is the, the uh, tobacco warehouse part of, of, of uh, Wilson. Wilson was a, was, a, was a huge center for, for tobacco production and processing throughout the uh, 20th century. So this is the space that's going to become the Whirligate Park. Really, actually, it's, it's more this space here. And you, see, and you see a view here. So this is the center of town. This is, this is downtown Wilson. This is the, 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 the main drag of, of Wilson is, is right here. So this is really very close to the center of town. Um, the project has been really fortunate to have uh, gotten some, some quite impressive funding so far, which has really allowed them to move forward with, with a lot of the efforts that we've been talking about. Uh, initially, a North Carolina Arts Council grant for 35000 to begin the, the, the documentation, park, park design, and conservation planning. The National Endowment has given two or three grants at this point, including an Our Town grant uh, for a quarter of a million, which focuses on conservation, uh, and it also centers on employment and, and job training. Uh, the art, an art place grant, which is really a consortium of various funders that have been bundled together, among them Ford, Mellon, the Knight, and Rockefeller Foundations. Uh, and again, tied in with the job training and employment, um, this, is a, this is a grant that, uh, in, in, the, in the words of its sponsors, uh, is akin to venture capital, seeing art as, as a linchpin for economic development. And that's really the hope in, in Wilson, is that, getting the, the, the Simpson collection downtown and, and in good uh, maintainable condition is really going to help Wilson to really develop more of an arts-based economy over the years that would include art, music, and other things like that. So there's a half a million dollar grant that came from there. That's, so that's really allowed the project to move forward. The uh, park is in the design phase right now. Uh, this is a very schematic uh, design done by Lapis and, and Havener, a landscape architecture firm out of Durham, North Carolina. This is continually being tweaked and, and, and worked on. So this is, a, uh, I think, a schematic produced this past summer. But uh, there, there's already been uh, changes to it as well. So then the question of, um, how these things are cared for, how they're, they're conserved, to prepare them to go back out of doors. Uh, again, here's, here's another case of being extremely fortunate. The large square shows the, um, the eventual site, the Whirly Gig Park. Only a block away is the Barnes Auto Parts Warehouse. This is an empty warehouse complex of, of buildings uh, in, in downtown uh, Wilson, which was, has been made available free of charge. And this has become the, the conservation lab. Um, and when I first toured the site, when it was, when it was empty, I, I thought, well, this is, this is a conservator's dream come true. I mean, you, you, you know, I don't know of a conservator of, of large-scale objects that, that wouldn't just fall all over him or herself just to be able to have this as a space. You have several different discrete warehouse areas. You have an outdoor space as well. To, for, the, for the things you need to be doing out of doors as opposed to indoors. So it really has become a great venue, and we'll see more of that when Ron 
uh, when Ron, Ron speaks next, or a after uh, Jeff. All right, so then take, taking up in December 2010, was the first phase of, of, of removals of whirly gigs. At this point, probably, about, I think 20, as of last week, 21 of the 30 odd uh, whirly gigs have been now brought in, brought in indoors. But this was the initial removal just a little over a year ago. And, and the placement of three of them, this is the initial three that were removed in. And the, the, um, again, the interesting thing about this project is that Volus has been involved at every step of the way. Um, I was pr personally really, Concerned, worried about the notion that they were going to be separated from the site that they were initially placed in. But the, the more I sort of thought about it and, and looked at and thought about the fact that Volus is on board, this is another phase of the project for Volus. This is another part of Volus's work. Because he's, he's as involved as he is, I think he feels that this is the best chance for these works to continue functioning the way he had, had intended them to, to uh, function. And he didn't, and, and he doesn't, there, and, and in talking with him, I think, and Jeff can talk more about this, they, they don't really seem to be site-specific the way other environments are, where there's a, a clear progression of how you have to move through a site and experience it. Um, with, Vala seems to conceive of these more as, as individual elements. So anyway, I, I want to uh, say that really what our challenge is for the, for the, for the future is, the, the, is long-term conservation. That's really what Ron is going to talk about next. So we're going to break it now, and then we're going to load up uh, Jeff's. We're going to put Jeff's on, and then Jeff is going to talk about um, his, his work with Volus over the last year and a half or, or, or two years and the way that relationship has developed over time. So thank you. <laughs>